Hey, you're listening to a Bible Bro Down podcast, a member of the Trinity Commission. This is where brothers come together to sharpen one another so we can rightly divide the Word of God. I'm Matt. And this is Billy. And we're back. And as promised, we're going to be talking about the Cranman versus Vela debate that was on capturing Christianity. Cra- <laughs> not capturing. Capturing <laughs> Christianity. <laughs> Ooh. And no offense. Yeah, it, <laughs> yeah no offense. Uh, it was it was an interesting debate. It, I I enjoyed it. A I want to say that it was cordial. I think the Vela Duffy debate was a little more heated, and we didn't talk about that on the podcast. But that was about open theism. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tyler here seems to have backed off. You know, put, revved it down a little bit, and uh, he and Cramman have more or less a, a pleasant conversation. So I did appreciate that. But I don't know, Billy. Want to do like overall feeling first before we jump in um they spent i mean the the debate was really about romans 9 and it ended up being a lot about election but i mean i guess that's ultimately what people are saying is happening in romans 9 that it's unconditional election so i can understand i mean that's ultimately what uh john uh stated from the beginning is that it boils down to that specific point uh, there's a lot of agreement on other stuff, but ultimately it's is what is being said in these verses talking about unconditional, you know, predestined election. They initially started, you know, I thought pretty well because they started looking, talk, like even uh, Tyler talked about going and looking at other passages that relate to this and in context and all that stuff, but then it just got narrowed down to election solely. Yeah, it, it... I agree, and I didn't. It didn't dawn on me until you just said that. But they really did. the The title or the subject of the debate probably should have been "Election is individual," and then "Pro or against." Yeah. Versus Romans nine, because you would expect, I don't know, more of the chapter to be considered, more of the context to be considered, and they did. They did both kind of hit on it, but it was, it was almost like a side thing. Mm-hmm. versus the election discussion. Correct. But we're still going to talk about the election discussion because it's still important. Right. So what we're going to do is we're not going to go through the openings. If you want to uh, uh, actually, Leighton, Soteriology 101, had Cranman on, and he and John talked about Tyler's opening. And if you want to hear that, and I think they're going to do another one about the, the cross-examination. We're skipping the openings. Uh, and we're going to go straight to the cross exam because I think that's where more of the debate actually happened, which is not unusual. And we want to we want to hit on some of the questions that some of the answers Tyler gave that Cramon to the questions Cramon asked, and then I want to really we're looking to answer some of the questions that uh, Tyler leveled at John that uh, I don't think were worded in the best way, and so John wasn't quite sure what was being asked. But we want to hit on those more so than we want to talk about the, the intros. If right. you want to hear the intros, Capturing Christianity, it's Cameron Bertuzzi's uh, uh, YouTube channel. Um, and go over there. Just give him a subscribe when you go over anyway because he's got a bunch of good stuff. And, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. Right. Yeah, I like, I like how he hosts things and I liked how he focused on during cross-examination. He wanted to be actually, hey, let's ask questions, you know, like a cross-examination in a courtroom. Yeah, instead of just arguing back and forth and mm-hmm. trying to make a point, you have to ask a question only in your time. Yeah. So we may jump around a little. Or we may fast forward through some stuff. We may not answer every single thing. We kind of have in our minds what points we want to hit on. So we're going to start at the beginning. Uh, John goes first in, in questioning Tyler, and then uh, that lasts for 15 minutes, and then Tyler gets 15 minutes to ask questions to John. So mm-hmm. that'll be the order. Ready? I am. Share. All right. Here we go. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. I can hear. Okay. Would you say, you said a lot there. I wish I I took notes. Would you say that there's a difference between corporate election, corporately electing those with faith and corporately electing uh, those with ethnicity or corporately electing people because of their ethnicity and work. Would you say there's a difference? I mean, conceptually, those are different, yes. Okay. I mean, the, the, so. the, 
they'd both be corporate election, but the reason for why one group would be election and, and how they're included would be different. But the, but the, I guess the concept of what is being elected, a, a corporate group, a faceless group, would be the same. If the problem in Romans 9, you, you mentioned that the problem is because of corporate election. Corporate election is a mode of election. It, it doesn't necessarily explain the content. So this is why I'm asking this question. If the content of election, or at least to the Jew, was that they think they belong into the elect of God because of their works and ethnicity under a corporate framework, you think that would be different than thinking that they belong to the people of God under a corporate framework by faith? You think God can elect corporately by faith and corporately by works and ethnicity? I, yeah. if that's, so, I, I, you understand so what I'm I, asking? It's a sort of. I mean, it, it's hard for me because asking what God could do, I mean, I think God can do whatever he wants. Asking what he has done, I, I don't think God has obviously elected corporately. So I think coming out of, coming out of Romans Romans 9, and, and, I, and I think um, you, you didn't really touch in your opening statement on, on verses 1 through 5, which is actually the lead-in for it. I think there's there's ample evidence that the, the corporate view that you've said that it's inclusion by the promise of God of what he's chosen is the problem because the the the, the question becomes if God has by his sovereign election chosen Israel, why isn't Israel being saved? Why are they all apostatizing? So the, the, the objection coming out isn't, well, why, why is the Jew over there? Why, is the, why are the unbelieving Jews saying, well, our ethnicity should get us? He's saying, well, why, why is it that God's promise of election to the Israelites seems like it's what's failing so it's actually the corporate view of election of israel whatever you take that corporate view to mean uh, that paul is addressing he's not actually addressing the 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 jewish conception which what was something like what jesus was which is well we're, we we are eth ethnically Jewish. N none of that is in the passage. He's saying the problem arises from out of this this understanding of the unfailing promises of God that God has foreknown and predestined and called and justified. All the kind. Well, then then why why does it seem like his elect group of Israel's why are so many of them not attaining salvation if all of those same promises were for the Jews? And Paul is coming back and saying, well, you have it wrong. God hasn't promised salvation corporately that way. God has always chosen the individuals. God has always chosen the remnant. That's just how it's always been. We shouldn't understand this corporately. All right, Billy. Uh, quite a bit there. Right. Where do you want to start? Well, I, I, I mean, that, that main point that Tyler's speaking of is about, it, it, it is a valid point, because it seems to be, because, you know, in, throughout the first five verses, it talks about the promises of God, right? Um, you know, and, you know, has, has God's word failed? And, you know, the one of the crux of the problems is what does that mean? Um, in, in terms of the context of this passage, it's, it's speaking of these promises made to Paul's people. So that would be the Israelites, correct? Physical Jews. Right. So have these promises that God made the physical Jews failed? So I think Tyler makes a valid point that it, it appears that there is this collective corporate promise made to the entire Jewish people. And has that promise failed? So, you know, he does make a point that it seems like that there is like a corporate view here, but Paul is arguing, is this corporate view correct? You know, did, did God corporately just pick all ethnic Jews to save? And is that really what it means? Yeah. And, and his answer is that, no, it's not corporate. It's individual. Whereas I think the actual answer is, no, it's not the corporate group you think it is. It's a different corporate group. It, because it, God's not saying, what Paul goes on to explain is, look, for the physical promises, God could pick Isaac over uh, Ishmael, and he could pick Jacob over Esau, and that, that's his prerogative. He can do that. He can pass it through a certain lineage. And then he relates that to salvation and says, just like that, God can pick a, a, what we would call his spiritual kingdom through a different lineage, namely those who are faithful. Mm -hmm. So it, it can sit. The answer does not have to be 
this is Paul's rebutting corporate election and he's saying it has to be individual. The answer can very easily and I think appropriately be God is saying that it is not that corporate group that those promises were made to. It is this other corporate group, this other lineage. And that lineage comes through Christ. Obviously, that's the point. And you see that in Galatians. Through faith, right. Through yeah, Christ, right, like right. By faith through the power and work of the cross through Christ. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think that was one of the, the, I don't know, that they went around and around about, about this for quite a while on this, this view. And, you know, Paul, I mean, it, it's definitely corporate because, I mean, in verse six, I wish they would have spent more time on the actual verses, you know, but it is not as though the word has God has, has failed. So these promises that were made corporately to Israel, right? Paul's descendants for all who are, for not all who are from Israel belong to Israel. So Paul is still keeping this in a corporate collective context. He's just narrowing down who is actually Israel, right? These, that these, these salvific promises belong to. Would you agree? Yes, and that's actually a theme that runs through 9 through 11, right. culminating in chapter 11, which is right. God it, it no longer is calling those people, the physical Israelites, his people, but now he has a new covenant people, and those people are the people of promise, the people through Christ who are going to receive all the promises. And that's what, again, it culminates in chapter 11, where you see God cutting off physical Israel from this, the, these promises, from this vine, a root, I think it's root, and he is grafting in these Gentiles into these promises, into this root, mm -hmm. into this family. So it is still a corporate thing. It is a redefining of who exactly is his people. That's what's happening here. Correct. And we've talked about this before. There's this misunderstanding of, oh, where do we have it on our website? Um, that the Old Testament promises made to like Abraham and the Jews, the Israelites, that they were unconditional like all of them is that true <laughs> in every instance where we see god promising anybody anything and again think about the idea of a legal precedent if we know god is going to act this way according to these covenants then can we expect him to act that way in his other covenants mm -hmm. consistently throughout the old testament in, in every place you can pull out god promises a whole bunch of stuff and then and the condition is, if you abide, essentially, right? If you are faithful to me, you will continue to prosper. You will have everything you need. You won't have to want for anything. I'll protect you from the world. But they don't. And then he, he eventually cuts them off. He gives them over. He divorces them. It's always conditional. Right. Every promise, except the one promise, which was that the heir, right, the seed would come through Abraham's descendants. That was the one unconditional promise. But all the rest of the promises always were to those who actually trusted and followed in him by faith. I mean, again, we have to take this in context of the entire scripture, you know, or even we can narrow it down to the book of Romans. I mean, in Romans chapter 4, Paul says, um, Romans four thirteen to 17, for the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would be heir of the world, that's the promise, the salvific promise, right? right. You know, um, was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For it is this reason, by faith, in order that it may be accordance with grace, so that the promise will be guaranteed to all the descendants. Paul has already made this point that these promises, this who are who are this Israeli, who are the Israelites, this Israel that he's been that he's speaking of now in Romans nine, are those who trust and and meet the condition of faith, who follow him. We see it over and over throughout the Old Testament that it was it was um, Genesis eighteen nineteen, right? The Lord says um, to Abraham that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. And how do you do what is right and just? You walk by faith. You listen to the Lord and you walk by faith. Then the Lord will give to Abraham what he promised him. All these salvific promises of inheriting the land and all that stuff. It was all done through faith. So this condition was always there, but the Jews missed the condition. They just thought, ooh, it's it's about it's about we're Israelites, we're we're you know, physical seed, so it's all it's all about that. But it never was. It was always about faith. And again, Paul makes that point throughout the entire book of Romans. Um if you go back to our, our Romans um, uh, series. Uh, when we get to Romans nine, we actually, you know, before we get to Romans nine, let's remember all these things that Paul has already talked about in the first eight chapters. And I go list by list of all of these conditional promises that come by faith. That that's what Paul has already established before he even gets to Romans nine. That 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 the promises of God come by faith through the work of Christ. 
Yeah, and well, I, I don't want to jump ahead. So uh, we'll leave it there. Um, good stuff. Let us continue and see what they say. Okay, I think I'll have to save uh, my response because it's more of a discussion yeah. response. So, yeah, um, yeah, I, I, I think you might miss be uh, misunderstanding some things there. Um, but anyways, uh, let me let me read you a quote from Douglas Moo. Uh, if Paul applies Old Testament texts according to their original intent, the Calvinist appeal to Romans nine is undercut and perhaps excluded altogether. Now we all know who I mean. Most you know who Douglas Moo is. Pause it again. Calvinist, he, a world class Calvinist scholar. Do you agree with him there? I, I want to reemphasize what um, we just said about Romans nine. That this, you know, it's it's not that Paul is arguing what Tyler is saying against corporate view. He he is um, arguing against a a corporate view, but it's a corporate view in terms of genetics, right? Right. That's what Paul, you're right. identifying the wrong corporate view. Right. Uh, corporate it's not because, and but uh, not all from Israel belong to Israel. He's still keeping these um, covenantal um, kingdom corporate promises to a corporation, to a group, true Israel. Um, but he's moving the goalposts and saying it's not about genetics, which is what we'll, we'll learn later that John tried to say. It's not, and he actually says it in his opening, that it's not about genetics and it's not about works. Um, but there is a condition, but it's, it doesn't have anything to do with those things. Right, and in that condition, what separates genetic Israel um, from from the Israel that the promises you know are for, um, Paul already established, which is faith. Again, so it's it's the the point that that Paul is arguing against a corporate view is true. He's arguing against a genetic works based corporate view, but he is still keeping it on a corporate pedestal, a you know a pointer that there is still a corporate promise promises um, given to Israel. Yeah. It, it, again, the, the answer is not Paul is arguing against that corporate understanding. Therefore, individual, the Paul is saying it's not that corporate group. It's another. It's right. a redefined. It's it's who God says it is. It's not. It doesn't matter if if you were born first. God gets to pick who it is. Right. And right. and you see that you know all throughout the New Testament, you see a oh we did a uh, a, a a series on. So the word of God might be fulfilled. Remember that? That word for fulfilled? And yeah. what it really means is kind of like a, it's like an opening. It doesn't mean that it's like verbatim. To, up, right. It's it's filling yeah. up. It's, it's, it's bringing fruition to what it truly means and what it, what it, what it uh, truly like was meant for. It's bringing mm -hmm. that to fulfillment, that, that fruition. And throughout the New Testament, we see these Old Testament passages um, fulfilled, not in a, in, a, in a literal generic sense, but in a um, metaphoric, allegorical, you know, like just like, you know, Moses lifted up the serpent, right? That was, that was a, it was, that wasn't like some, um, you know, that, that there was going to be something happening like that, but there was going to be a type that happened like that, which was the cross. Similitude. Yeah, yeah, similitude. It wasn't that, you know, when, when, when God purchased and bought and redeemed and freed from slavery the entire nation of Israel from Egypt, right? That, that, that freedom came through a spiritual sense through Christ, that Christ bought the world. He purchased the world. He redeemed the world. He removed them from slavery, right? So that those um, may trust in him and may walk in faith to him, right? And, and if they do, as in the wilderness, then those who trust in him and follow him will inherit the promises, right? That similitude, that's what we see. Really starting to preach. Sorry. It's been a while. No, it feels cool. good. It's, I don't know. I'm it. <laughs> um, okay. So John just asked Tyler, hey, you know Douglas Moo. I think it's Douglas. You know Moo. He said that Paul would be using these these Old Testament verses, like Ezekiel, right? Uh, in their original context, he wouldn't be changing it to individual. And Tyler's about to reply. So let's see. Can, can you say can you say the quote again? Yeah, I, if if Paul applies Old Testament texts according to their original intent, the oh. Calvinist appeal to Romans nine is undercut and perhaps excluded altogether. Do you agree with him? Well, it's hard because that, you're, you're now giving me a contextless quote. I mean, so in one way, I could say yes, I, I I do agree with that. If Paul is taking the entire Old Testament, dragging it. 
uh, you know, it, the full context, you can, full context and all, and you can't, you know, there's, there's, there's no, there's no New Testament, uh, you know, interpretation of that passage. Then there would, there, there may be a problem there if that's what we take. I don't think Moo is actually affirming that. I know Moo's position. I'd be massively surprised if that, if the context of that quote didn't matter, because for for many many reasons. I would look at the passage, and, and, and I brought this up in my opening statement. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I think that there are there are markers in Romans 9 that are dealing with individuals. Again, we can't use crass allegorization, allegorization that way. I mean, you have Rebecca and Sarah. What nations do they stand for? You have the promises given to them. What promises to nations are, are those given for? You have it speaking of the individual men before they were born not doing anything good or bad. It's speaking of the individual specifically, um, which tells us that Paul isn't probably carrying that entire text over. And we know that the New Testament does this all the time. So for you know the example I give, and I actually have it as a question for you, so if you want to percolate on it, is we know that Matthew brings up Hosea and says, out of Egypt, I called my son. Well, in Hosea, that's clearly calling uh, talking about Israel. So does that mean that Matthew has to rip that passage, carry the entire context of Hosea into his passage, and therefore he's not talking about the calling of individual individual Jesus out of Egypt? Of course not. That's just not how we handle New Testament citations of the Old Testament. So if you're going to push that point, that's just hermeneutically and exegetically an unsound way of doing exegesis of how New Testament passages handle Old Testament passages. Ah. Okay. Uh, well, I'm working backwards because I kind of forgot some of the things he said. It was right. A long answer. Um, you should pause more, like Leighton does, every two seconds. Every two seconds. We, we get, if we don't hit three hours on this, I'm going to be upset. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't have three hours. <laughs> I know. We're going fast. The, the idea that um, <clears throat> out of Egypt I've called my son, right? Obviously mm -hmm. about Israel, later used about Jesus. You said that we have an episode on fulfillment. And that would be a situation where this applies. There is ekbatic and telic fulfillment. Mm -hmm. Ekbatic is um, uh, there a excuse me? Telic is on purpose. God does something in the Old Testament. He intends for it to be carried out in an exact way. Take Isaiah fifty-two. Um, all the descriptions of Christ's crucifixion. That is a telic prophecy. It is a fulfillment when Jesus is beat and, and our wounds <coughs> applied to him. Uh, it is on purpose. Ekbatic is when we see something, uh, there are similarities. There, It is a, um, oh, what is the word? I can't think of it. Uh, basically, something happened in the Old Testament. It's not necessarily meant to apply to something in the future, but it ends up being used that way. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, what is it? It's a coincidence. It's a coincidental right. uh, kind of prophecy, right? And so when, when Israel is called out, that at the time was God's child uh, that he had chosen. Mm -hmm. And then later Jesus himself goes, and that is literally God's child. Mm -hmm. And so when he's called out, it, it is ecbatically applied back to that situation, that, that, that similitude, that shadow. Right. So it, do, the, the idea that, um, I, I don't know. I don't see a problem there. It, it, same with, with, right. I think it's, it's um, the problem is when you take it, we all understand that the New Testament writers give us um, more revealed meaning of Old Testament passages, but they don't sure. give us something that is not like inherently like present in the text itself. Like it doesn't like completely turn it, turn it on its end where there's no correlation whatsoever. You know what I mean? Um, like you, you, you can understand the whole, you know, I, you know, I, I called my son out of Egypt and how, you know, that, that kind of applied to Christ and, and that that's not like turning the text upside down. But when you start taking something um, from the Old Testament and reinterpret it in the New Testament in a completely and just like like almost a backwards like totally 180 degree understanding. That's what is eisegesis. That's what I don't believe any and, and the way we understand scripture. You don't have to do that. You don't have to turn it upside down. It doesn't change um, the narrative, the basic narrative of those Old Testament passages. I mean that's eisegesis. And if if you know if anyone today were to do that, you know they'd be ridiculed. Well, and, and I guess my point is, it, it's not unusual. I guess I didn't need to focus too much on that. Because bringing it back to Romans 9, it's not unusual for an individual name to be used to talk about a group of people. Right. Out of Israel, like, out of Egypt, I call my son. That's mm -hmm. a singular uh, noun. 
and yet it's talking about a whole group of people. Correct. We know that in Ezekiel, uh, Jacob and Esau are individuals, but clearly it's talking about Israel and Edom, mm -hmm. the kingdoms themselves. And so when you get to the New, Te New Testament, Paul doesn't have to. Hey, well, and, and I think Tyler's kind of begging the question here because he's already established that he thinks that Paul is rebutting corporate and, and focusing on an individual, and therefore he should take these passages as individual, even though what Paul is quoting is talking about a corporate group. Yeah, and, he, and later on we'll see, he, he does mention that, uh, I don't know when we'll get to this, um, but he talks about, you know, Paul's narrowing, he narrows down his view of, of you know, because Tyler mentioned the remnant, right? Um, throughout this video, like, you know, it's, it's the remnant of Israel, um, you know, and Tyler obviously says that that remnant is from God unconditionally choosing them from the foundation of the world. Um, but that's, that's not what it's, it, it's not what happening. So Tyler is even saying that there is, um, a corporate view, you know, uh, it's just narrowed down and that's exactly what Paul says right in the beginning. You know, all Israel is not from Israel, corporate Israel. Well, but, and I, I think that's such an important. You keep pointing that out. Israel, not all, not all Israel is Israel. Right. He's still talking about a group. Correct. So, to, so to say that he is only focusing on individuals is incorrect because he is defining who that group is. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I do want to point out. I'm glad you remember. You reminded me when or earlier Tyler mentioned the remnant, as if the remnant are individually chosen. Right. But when you talk, when you look in chapter ten, for instance, you go to the very next chapter. And it talks about the remnant, talks about that situation of God saving for people for himself. It doesn't say that he, it always talks about them as a, as a collective, as mm -hmm. the faithful. Those who are faithful are included in the remnant, and that's who he has saved. Are they individually uh, picked by God to be that? In a way, if they are faithful, God says, you are mine, right? But the criteria by which he chose those individuals is open to anybody. And it is, it is a predefined corporate group. The faithful will be his. Right. Almost. And, and it, it goes exactly to our point uh, that we've addressed multiple times. Now, what does remnant mean? <laughs> Even in the Greek, what does it mean? The leftovers? The... Right. The yeah. leftovers, the remainder, right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's remnant, like what remains, what is left over. So even in the very word itself, it talks about big corporate view, right? Israel, you know, genetic Israel, big corporate view, right? The remnant who remained in the covenant, who remained heirs, who remained in receiving the promises, the faithful. And, and let's just go ahead and tie in an even bigger uh, theme from the scripture. And that is uh, spiritual warfare and, and the point of what is happening from the very beginning, man sins, humanity is cursed. And God is going to choose for himself a people or a kingdom. And you read through Matthew. And that's one of the reasons I think that, that Matthew focused so much on the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven is here. Mm -hmm. The kingdom of God has come. And it's because in this spiritual warfare type setting, everybody who chooses to the world is given over to the rulers of this world. Everybody who chooses God becomes a part of his kingdom. He is keeping a certain a remnant, right? The, those who are left over, those who have not chosen the world, they are left over. They are faithful to him. And he, he pulls them out, draws them to Christ, and they are his kingdom, his people. Mm -hmm. And that's that the exact is, analogy Paul uses, too, with when he talks about uh, is it Elijah or the other one. You know, what, I, I, you know, I'm the only one left. I'm the only one left, left, remain, yeah, right? Elijah. Right? Yeah. No, I, there, there's. There's how many others that have not bowed down? So there's still people who have remained faithful to me, who remain in the promises. Exactly. So when you have Paul using uh, passages from Ezekiel and, and pulling them forward in time to the New Testament, it, it, do you have to see them as individual? No. If you try to see them as individual, can you... Uh, is there an argument for... See, this is, this is one of the problems. Calvinism is consistent within itself, right? It, it, we would say it's, it's, it's like a, a decent bubble <laughs> of theology, <laughs> but it doesn't answer everything in Scripture. It just works cohesively inside within itself. its own system. Right. You're right. But the problem is, uh, so th that makes critiquing it a little hard because I can put on my Calvinist hat and go, well, yeah, Tyler makes sense. He, he can make this argument that 
Paul is going to use it in a different way to mean individuals. But if you step back, the overall theme is not individuals. Paul is still defining who Israel is as mm-hmm. a corporate de- definition. And so there's no reason not to pull forward the context that it was used in the first place. Got, Paul didn't choose uh, Ishmael. He chose Isaac. What, for what? The lineage. He chose that lineage. Right. Paul didn't choose the Edomites. He chose the Israelites. Right. He, he is still talking about a lineage. And then uh, he, going back to Paul didn't choose physical Israel. He chose spiritual Israel. Mm-hmm. It's all about lineages and kingdoms and not individuals. Right. So. Right. And I think one of the, the drawbacks of, of it's so easy when you get into a debate to um, because, you know, everything so you know, you got, you're on the hot seat, so to speak. Um, yeah. You know, it's easy to do Monday, Monday Tongue morning, tied. Monday morning quarterback, like we're doing. <laughs> That's how we roll. Yeah. yeah. But you know, there's, there's multiple views of what election means. Correct. You know, election means Probably to, too many. Yes. to choose. Right. And you have, you know, all throughout the scripture, you have multiple ways that's used. You have, as Paul has even stated here in Romans nine, you have a corporate view of election. The, these, these, this corporate promise to, Israel, right? But you also have um, individual election, right? Is is that how do you get put into that corporate um, collection that's going to receive those promises? How do we as Gentiles get grafted into the body, right? This corporate elected body, how do we get grafted in there? And that's individual election. You know, that's that conditional promise that was even in the Old Testament, as Paul says in Romans 10, that, you know, the, the word of faith that he's been preaching in, uh, was preached back in Deuteronomy chapter 29, when, when Moses talks about, you know, the righteous man who will live by faith. Um, you see that over and over again. So you have this individual election where I trust in the Lord and God then chooses to place me into the corporate body. Right, he elects to put me into Christ, and now I am one of the elect, the corporate elect, who are going to receive the promises and be conformed to the image of Christ. And everyone that is in that 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 corporate bubble, that corporate um, body, at the end, will have been called and justified and glorified, and so forth and so forth. Mm-hmm. All right, let's roll. Let me ask you a question: When in, in Genesis. The, the, the passage that uh, Paul cites when he chooses when God chooses Jacob, does God simultaneously choose Jacob's descendants there when he chooses Jacob? The same well, passage you would say signif- signifies that God chooses Jacob. Well, the promises are for you and for your children. I mean, the the, the same promise is given to us in Acts, right? The promises are for you and for your God, children. Well, let me let me rephrase. Right? So, does, does God choose? Jacob's descendant simultaneously as the people of Israel when he chooses Jacob. You're going to, I mean, you're opening a can of worms of, of, of covenantal theology, right? Because it, in, a, in a sense, it's going to be, yes, God has determined that his, that his, the, the, the redeemer would come through that very specific line. He traces it out. But in another sense, when you get to Exodus, when you get to Deuteronomy, those are covenant making agreements. God is actually choosing Israel for service at that point. So it, it's not exactly as clear cut as you have, but even let's imagine I even said, yes, let's imagine I said, okay, at the time that that God is choosing Isaac well I mean we could look at Abraham it says I, I chose Abraham and part of the promise is that you will be a father of many nations specifically one by which the Redeemer will come right so but does that mean therefore that when we're talking about salvation in Romans 9 that that corporate election is how salvation is done that God corporately elects that way. No, you're you're making a huge leap in logic to tie those two things together. Right. I'm not is that a huge that... leap in logic? Because it's literally how he explains it. In, I, I, you made the point earlier. We wish that they had used more scripture. Just gone through Romans nine, mm-hmm. and here you have a lot of discussion that is talking kind of about the text, but not actually referencing the text. And so it, it's it's frustrating because. It, Again, you, you nailed it. You hit it on the head. Not all Israel is Israel. He's talking about a group of people. Right. And, right. and it, John's question is good when because he's trying to draw out the distinction. Is God in Genesis electing Jacob or is he electing a people? 
Right. He's electing a people. He's, he's choosing a people. God's portion is Israel. That's, mm-hmm. that's the point. Right. And, and we got to, again, look at this in the context of Romans 9. Paul is talking about the salvation of his brethren, right? That these promises about the Messiah, you know, that the Messiah has come and gone. And where are these promises to, you know, the genetic Israel? And Paul's saying that, no, you, you guys missed it. That the promise wasn't just for genetic Israel, wasn't, you know, based on, you know, who your father was. It was based in terms of salvation, right? Tyler does make a point there. In terms of salvation, because these promises, some of them were like just genetic promises in general. Um, again, where the, the lineage of the, the Messiah would come from. Um, these promises, these salvific promises to um, Israel, you know, were for those who met the condition of faith. And we can't also narrow down the scope of of this. You know, Tyler will bring up, you know, what about Sarah and what about, you know, these other people and all that stuff, right? That's not the context and the the scope of what Paul is teaching through using them, right? We we have taught that God has, has shown and used Israel and the occurrences and the way he spoke to them and the all those various things that he did with the law and the temple and the sacrifices and all these things, right, um, are big shadows of how God has always interacted with the world, right? Um, you can go back to Romans chapter 1, right? That the gospel is the power of God, right, to all who believe, right, from first to last. Matt, did that first start, like, the day Christ died, or where does that first start? First, right. The, the first so one. the gospel has yeah. always been the same, which is mm. trust in God and and you're going to be saved, right? Through the power and work of the cross, right? Through the work of Christ, yeah, you're going to be um, inheriting the promises if you trust and follow the Lord through faith. That's from first to last, right? So this gospel, sh- you know, shadow that has been over Scripture the entire time doesn't it doesn't doesn't lose its its value or its power because God decides to um, teach us a bunch of shadows and bring about the Messiah through the lineage of the ethnic group of Israel. You know, no, Paul talks right. about how the law goes away, right? In, is it in Galatians? Well, but, I was going go to go fir- But the first covenant still remains, right? <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. If this were an election debate, uh, I would I would kind of steer at that point to Galatians 4, the second half of Galatians 4. I'm always talking yeah. about the first half, but the second half where he says, now Israel is like the, the, the son of, or the child of Hagar and the, the church is the son of, of Sarah mm-hmm. because Israel is in bondage to the law, but the church is free under this. So it, it's, it's interesting um, even there that you have individual, uh, a, a um, yeah, it, it's a singular pronoun that the child referring to the entire people that God is, is choosing for himself. Correct. And then it, the question is, how is that defined? Romans 4, 23 through 24, well, actually all of Romans 4, uh, the, those who have faith like Abraham, we too are credited with righteousness like he was. We're considered his son and we're included in the promises, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, I... I there's definitely, you know, a, a narrowing down in the context of what we're talking about here. It's, it's Paul's talking about the promises that relate to salvation, and he he keeps it as a. It's not a genetic thing. It's a still a corporate thing. These promises made to Israel, these these physical that actually have spiritual connotation, you know, big spiritual promises. You know, of, you know, the promised land is really the promised land of of our future inheritance of the world. Um, you know, that is the context that what Paul is talking about. Yeah, and yeah, I wish it had been more because it, us having the discussion about what Romans nine would be, we would want to start with six. I mean, you know, one through five, we all kind of know. He just, Paul's upset. Uh, six. He's answering that question. Is it okay? A. So we think there are three big questions that are happening in Romans nine. The first one is is you know what about these promises? Um, and Paul's answer essentially is God has the right to define who is going to receive these promises. It doesn't go to every one of Abraham's kids. And so it, it, the, the point is, um, yes, it is about salvation, but when he's talking about God choosing Isaac over Ishmael and Jacob over Esau, he, he's just saying God has the right to choose which child, which lineage these promises go to. Mm-hmm. And the physical Jews did not get it. The spiritual Jews did. Mm-hmm. Like that's, that's God's prerogative. So again, bring it back to the text, but yeah, whatever. Ready? 
context rep- is salvific. I'm asking you if if the choice of God's people in the Old Testament, the way he elects his people, is it corporate? When God chooses Jacob, does God choose Israel in Jacob as a result of their being uh, Jacob's descendants? Does he uh, so, simul- does he, I'm asking what type of election is that? What mode of election is that? that is it corporate? That is- no, it's collect. So I, I so you have to remember. I, I mean, I'm I'm a Calvinist, so I'm going to start from a different presupposition than you are. I, I- can, can I just throw in real quick? Uh, that I find it a little bit ironic that Calvinism that focuses so much on corporate headship when it's talking about what Adam did. Right. Uh, when we get here, it's like, but no, it's not. It's not corporate. <laughs> I, I'm is, not isn't a collective and a corporation what? very like i mean uh, when they started debating like collective versus corporate I'm like who cares it's just talking about a group yes yeah i, I agree uh, yeah like when the curse when adam and eve sinned and the curse fell on them guess who it also applied to the collective human of, of humanity <laughs> right when god yeah. promised you know abraham it also uh, you know went to the collective of his children who that then got narrowed down, like later by God, when it went to Jacob, who it, it actually didn't get narrowed down from that point because it was his twelve sons, right? It was also the collective or the corporate, right? The corporate family of of Israel. Yeah, I, I, we'll listen to his answer. I think what we'll find is just a distinction without a difference. Yeah, corporate, collective, company, whatever. A blank slate and concede that because I think God determines all things whatsoever comes to pass. So I'm very comfortable saying it's a collectivist uh, 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 choosing. So in the same way that I, again, that I brought this up, in the same way that I know my family, I don't know my family as this abstraction. I don't say, well, I chose my wife and so therefore I have this abstract thing as a family. I know my family in that I know my wife and my two sons. When you chose your wife, Sarah, didn't you also gain all of her family? Yeah, I became far, part of that family. The collective, so was like, the corporate. You, you chose one and, and all of them became yeah. yours. Yeah, and I inherited all of it, yes. Okay, just checking. By name individually. So I'm fine with the fact that God has chosen Isaac and his children for service throughout but again, and I'm going to keep coming back to this, when we're talking about the salvation question, when we're talking about Romans 9, you can't smuggle that assumption back in because that is exactly the contention, right? The exact contention. Oh, I'm sorry. I keep pausing. Uh, when he said, when he uses words like smuggling and thrusting the Old Testament upon, it doesn't, it, it all just begs the question that his view is right. Therefore, it is inappropriate to do that. Whereas I would think, it is appropriate to bring the full context in and only narrow it down if explicitly said so by the author. Right. So. Yeah, I mean, we when we went through the entire book of Romans, we looked at all the. We mean, there's I think nine plus you know Old Testament passages that Paul uses in, in just chapter nine. We went through all of them and we remained in context to what they mean within the in the the picture. We didn't have to turn it upside down. When when Paul talks about you know. Uh, and he quotes Moses and God having mercy upon him on whom he has mercy. We can see that you know, the context is that God was going to judge the entire nation of Israel. And through the context, through Moses' faithfulness, right? Moses' faithfulness, he showed mercy upon the entire nation of Israel. That's just the context of Christ being, you know, it was Christ's faithfulness that we now have mercy. Right? The entire human, human race has had mercy because of the faithfulness of Christ. Yeah, and if you can consistently do it, throughout the entire chapter, you can prove that Paul does use things in context. Go, going back all the way to Romans 1 and talking about the righteous man will walk by faith, uh, Romans 3 and the several, what is it, like 11 different citations that he uses mm-hmm. right there. In the, uh, all of them that completely make sense in context. He's talking about people under the law. Right. Uh, Romans 4 in context. Romans, uh, anyway, I'm not going to try to do all of them off of memory because it's been a while, but... <laughs> <laughs> it, it, there's no reason to assume that 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 is inappropriate to bring that context forward. Right. It doesn't make sense to me. I mean, that's that should be the default, like you said. That's what you start with. You know. Right. You you don't come up with some something brand new and, and then try to you know force it back in the Old Testament and then when it doesn't fit, to say, oh, you don't have to. It's new revelation. We we obviously would take context into into a court, right? We're not going to just say um, that. 
it, we bring the context forward and we don't look at anything else. Yeah, I show you a video of, of somebody shooting someone else. Up, oh, he's a murderer. No, let's 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 open up the video and see what happened before that. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, anyway, let's go. Intention is when it comes to salvation, Paul is saying it's always been by God's free choice for whomever, individuals, not whatever, for whomever uh, he chooses to have mercy on and whomever he chooses to show wrath on that that he has that he has uh, that he has fashioned from beforehand uh, the vessels of mercy and the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. Why does Jacob's descent on, on what basis does Jacob's descendants get chosen? And do you, would you say let me I'm trying to I hear what you're saying because you're making a difference between a collectivist approach. Ultimately, what I think you mean by that. In, any interest in just skipping to where Tyler starts asking questions? Because I, I, I do. Yeah, I think they, they I mean, they focus completely, continue to focus just on this. Like he try, continues to try, John seems like he tries to hammer him down to just to understand that, hey, you know, God was using a, a corporate election. You know, when he picked Jacob, he picked the entire nation of Israel. He picked Abraham, he picked his descendants and narrowed it down a little bit for the lineage. Um, I, and, but they just go back and forth with that. I do want to point out, so Cameron, later on, before the kind of, uh, I can't remember what he calls it, but the, the open discussion, essentially, right. Cameron brings up this this analogy that we've used in the past. He he calls it a swim team. I think we've called it a football team. But Billy, if I if I have the, the world's largest pool and I, and I say, okay, everybody who comes and, and signs up on this registration thing gets to swim in my pool, and you show up and you sign the registration, and I say, Billy, welcome to the pool. Go on in. I, I'm, I'm individually welcoming you, mm -hmm. but the invitation was to everybody. It was a, it was a right. corporate thing. Everybody who signs this list gets to go in. You individually, happy you signed the thing. Right. Come on in. Right. So you, both, you know, right? the swim team will receive, you know, free membership and, you know, forever and, you know, free access to the pool and they, all these other, you know, they get free towels and all this stuff, right? Now I just made a, I just chose a corporate swim team, right? And then I individually, oh, guess what? You've met the qualification of the swim team, which again, we would say is faith, not at work. Um, and now they're put into the collective choosing of the swim team. Individually, they're put into the chosen group who receive the promises. And you see that, and you see those two types of things all throughout scripture is that they, they, they also like miss this point of like individual election is actually different than corporate election. There's, there's, they go hand in hand. And then, yeah, you mentioned Cameron tried to make that point. He's like, I don't see any, what's the big deal if they fit together. <laughs> yeah. And the coach of the swim team is now can say, Billy is mine. He, he is yeah. my swim team person. Right. What do you call a he swimmer? I guess. Right. Uh, yeah. So it, 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 the the language being both corporate and individual still makes complete sense, and, and we won't get to that part with where Cameron tries to make that point. But I just wanted to bring that up because I think it's wrong to try to assume that that it is somehow um, can't you can't be, have both can't right be tied together right right. Yeah. Okay, jumping forward to Tyler asking. John questions, and I don't know if we'll get all the way through that one as well, but I really wanted to hear the first 10 minutes or so because there's some wording issues. We'll yeah. Oh, play. Our questions. Here we go. Okay. Whenever you, 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 whenever you begin asking... So really fat my, my my wife is putting my children to sleep and I just realized our oh, monitors yeah. are in here. I'm gonna go turn off the sound of those and I'll be back in two seconds. Oh, okay, do that. So John skip. as Ishmael was because okay, let's get back to the debate. So Tyler, whenever you're ready to start your cross examination, uh, I'll just start the timer when you start talking. Sure. All right. Uh, so, John, uh, can you give any citations of any scholar before Pierre Moray in the nineteen thirties who affirmed the corporate view? No. Can you name I, pause. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, later on, there you probably recall there's the exact question about this. Um, and Tyler goes on for about three minutes about saying that really, you know, you don't really want to trust in, in, in you know, early scholars and things like that. <laughs> the question yeah, is irrelevant. The irony. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's hilarious. Later on, like, same thing. He, he goes on for, like, and I, I think Cameron picked up on it because when you watch Tyler give his answer, he starts, like, smiling. Like, didn't he just ask a very similar question? Like, was an early person, you know, church father who, who did this? 
It's really yeah, a yeah, relevant. Yeah. I mean, we can't. We've talked about this. I don't want to talk over you, but it's so nice not to talk about you know, the stuff I have to deal with in my normal job. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it, it's we don't. You can't. That's not an argument, right? If, if when Christ came and, and turned everything upside down, it's not like, well, they didn't teach this for the past 2,000 years, right? So we can't believe it. It's obviously not true, but nobody taught this for the 2,000 years. And then when, you know, the Catholic Church was in charge for all this time and the Reformers came along and, 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 and Martin Luther, you know, did his whole thing and people were like, well, this hasn't been taught for 1,400 years. Yeah, obviously, it's they, wrong. They, they also had a, a bad habit of when you taught something that was different than what the Catholic Church taught, they, they would kill you and burn all your stuff. <laughs> yes. So it was kind of hard to maybe retain some of that. But yeah. again, it, just because, like, and, and I think Tyler would agree with this, just because someone hasn't said it before doesn't mean it's right. Logically, that is right. a complete non sequitur. You yes. cannot claim that a point is incorrect because nobody's ever said it. Yeah, but it, it's, a, it's an easy debate. Like, ooh, I got a point. It's a jab. Yeah. 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 Okay. Very, very many before Bart or Hobbes popularized it in the West. No, I do know that there is a, a church father, and uh, his name slips my mind, um, that he, he, there's a quotation from him that alludes to corporate election, but his name slips my mind. Okay. So, uh, you're obviously more, more learned than I am. I don't, I'm not in seminary, so. But yeah, go ahead. That's fine. Uh, was Isaac just as much corporately chosen as Isma Ishmael was because he was the seed of Abraham? Okay, so going into these questions, just know, I think, and Tyler, feel free to like message us and tell us we're wrong, but I think Tyler got some names switched up here. Just a tongue-tie thing, not on purpose, but you know, debates, live discussion, whatever. And th I think his point is, uh, is Ishmael just as elect as Isaac because he's, because he's physically descended from Abraham. Mm -hmm. He gets to switch here, and then later he switches up Jacob and Esau a little bit. Right. But... Uh, just be aware that's kind of happening. Can you repeat that? Was Isaac just as much corporately chosen as Ishmael was because he was the seed of Abraham? No. Okay. Was Esau just as much corporately chosen as Jacob was because he was the seed of Abraham and Isaac? See, he did it right there. No. no. Okay, so can you explain to me if if the corporate election uh, came through the promise of Abraham, why these two children of Abraham were not included in that corporate lineage? Let me see if I understand what your question is. Can you maybe rephrase the question? Are you asking me if corporate is, is your question? If corporate election is true, why don't they meet that criteria it, of election? It, is that what is that what you're asking? If 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 you're because. I'm trying to just ask questions, so let me try to rephrase. Okay. If the corporate election of Israel was through the promise given to Abraham, and Ishmael and Jacob were unbelieving heirs of Abraham, why are they not part included as part of the corporation just as much as the unbelieving Jews were? I would say, repeat the question again. Let me make sure. Okay. The John, I assume, has not heard this question put this way. It doesn't help that it was the names were kind of jumbled. Uh, this drove me a little crazy. <laughs> the, mm -hmm. the, repeating the question, and then he, he, he'll move on here in a second. Billy, if God, if Ishmael and Esau are both legitimate children and grandchildren of at Abraham, why aren't they included in the promises? That's the question. Mm hmm. Why you know if if that was a corporate promise, why weren't they included? Basically, yeah, exactly. Um, I think that that that's where we're missing the point is that going back to verse six, what is the context of what we're talking about? All Israel is not Israel, right? All the so all these salvific promises, bigger context of what I just spoke of in the first six verses, right? And th those those salvific promises, all Israel is not from Israel, right? So. Now, let me give you an example. I'm going to go back even before Israel. Abraham wasn't Israel, right? Not physical Israel. Right. It wasn't right. until like two, two generations later where we actually have Jacob, Israel, right, come to be. So why does Paul go back two generations? To, to give you an example of, of look, this, this idea that you have that this is genetic is not right. Let me give you an example that 
if, if you guys are just relying on your lineage, look, Abraham had two sons. Only one of them received the, the promise. Isaac had two sons. Only one of them received the promise. So he's giving an example of, of, of that this isn't just a genetic thing. It's not a, just, just a birthright that you have. Well, but you get what Tyler's doing, right? He's trying to say uh, corporate wrong because that doesn't right. make sense. Uh, individual right. Right. It, it, what, what, what's the problem is, is that when, when Paul answers that way, he is saying God has the right to pick which lineage he wants. Mm -hmm. So, yes, it can still be corporate, but God doesn't have to open it up to every single lineage. Right. He picked a particular lineage. And, right. He went from still, Abraham to corporate. Isaac to Jacob. And then, right. guess what? He stopped at Jacob because it actually went to all of Jacob. Right. right. It went to all of Israel. <laughs> <laughs> so, so why did if God made a corporate promise to Abraham, why did not why was Ishmael and Esau excluded? Because God was not under any He didn't promise to give it to all of Abraham's lineage. Right. So it, yeah, it, it, God has the right to determine that. Uh, mm -hmm. That's how I would have answered that question. Right. Because I, there's different I'll, levels to it. I want to make sure I answer it correctly. I'll, 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 move, I'll move on, actually. Sorry. Um, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to that, be difficult. That's a, it, it's a, it, it's it's a very nuanced. I know. Very nuanced. Um, in, in election passages in the New Testament, is the subject uh, us as Christians or the method of salvation? The subject of the verb. So when it says God has chosen, is that subject usually a personal pronoun of per individual persons or is it of a, a, a corporate? Is it the church or is it the process of salvation being included by faith? I would say, uh, depending on the passage, I would say it's, it's corporate. It, it, it refers to the church. Can you get. Mm, mm -mm. Okay. Billy has a couple studies on election. Mm -hmm. He's probably looking those up right now. I have, I've I've had one up since the beginning. <laughs> right. Uh, I, let's go ahead and it, there is t there are times it, which is unfortunate that Tyler would just like make this one monolithic question. There are times when it refers to God's elect, as in the people. There are t numerous times where it refers to Jesus specifically. He is the elect, and there are times when uh, Paul is talking about us as elect, meaning us. In, you know, Billy's elect, Matthew's elect, mm -hmm. Tyler and John and Cameron are all elect. Uh, asking for John to say, okay, all of these situations, how is it used? Is, is I think, inappropriate because it, t it demand that you have to look at the context, right? <laughs> it, they're going to be different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we have a study called The Call, The Call, The Call, The Chosen, and The Elect. Yes, and the another call. one called Calvinist Elect versus the Bible's Elect. <laughs> yes, <laughs> right. <laughs> because they are different. <laughs> <laughs> they are different, yeah. Um, yeah, you have all, you know, and you have also different, like, verb tenses and, and how, you know, you have, like I said, you have the called, the invited, right? Like, you are the among the invited of God. Um, and you have uh, the chosen, and then you have the elect or the elected. And uh, how those are used, I mean, you're called, you were chosen, you know, the children of your chosen sister greet you. Um, or another, uh, but, let's see, those accompanying the lamb are the, um, the, 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 What's it? I always use invited because it makes more. You understand the context. Those that come to the lamb are the invited, the chosen, and the faithful, right? So that's a corporate view. Um, and th but then you just have elect, just being that that choice or the, or that that the chosen. Um, there there remain a remnant according to the election of grace in Romans eleven five. Um, f but in regard to election, this is talking about Jews as a whole, right? In Romans 11, in regard to the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but in regard to election, they are dearly loved for the sake of the fathers. That's corporate. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah you see it multiple places all over in, in various contexts. It's, you know, it's, you know, the chosen, it could be the chosen one or the chosen, like you're the chosen. Yep. So, uh, it, it, yeah, if you want to see what we think about that, uh, we don't have time to go through all of them, but if I will roll down and Jim. Uh, no. If you want to email us, BibleRodan at gmail.com, BibleRodan.com, click on studies, or actually scroll to the bottom of the page on the first page, and there's a little Google search bar. There may be a couple ads as your top results, but if you search for something and we have any studies that have that word in it, you'll find it in that search. So, here we go. Give me a single example where the subject of the verb having to do with election or choosing is the corporate church or is the process of salvation by faith and not individuals. Billy, didn't you just give us one? 
Mm -hmm. Okay, so that was a single. Okay, we answered that question. Uh, I would say Romans 8, the golden chain. I would say those in that passage refers to the church. It's a collective singular. So, so, uh, so that's a that's a collective though. I'm asking for a corporate. You understand the difference? <laughs> it's, I just wanted to pull out my hair at that point. That's a collective. I want um, Yeah, tomato, tomato. I just, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I'd be interested in seeing the the differences laid out side by side, corporate versus collective. Um, in reference to John's answer. Those being those who love God, those are the ones who will be uh, justified, glorified, etc. Called justified, glorified. Mm -hmm. um, that sounds like a decent answer. Uh, but yeah, again, I don't understand the difference between collective and corporate. Yeah, and I think they spend a while. That, on that, that is what. I Did, say that more time. I said, and they spend a while on hashing that back and forth. Mm -hmm. I would say it's a corporate. It, it refers to the church collectively, so I would say it's it's a corporate body. Okay. If we're elected into a relationship with God, can you explain what it means for that to be the case if he's choosing people who are already in a relationship as a condition to be elected? Yeah, ask that again. So you, you had mentioned that, um, uh, that, that God is, is choosing and electing us in Christ to be, uh, to be in him, um, but that the condition for that was for, for us to have faith in Jesus Christ, which already is a relationship with Jesus Christ. So if we're being elected to be in relationship with Jesus Christ, can you explain what it means for him to be choosing people who are already in a relationship as the condition, because the, they're, they already are expressing faith, how is it that they're being elected to the very relationship that is the condition of them being elected? Can you give me an example from Scripture? I, I don't think that, there is an example from Scripture. Yeah. This, is, this, is, this is your view. So you, you had made... Can't ask him questions, argument. John. You just got to answer. Okay. I'm not sure I understand the question. Which, I, as jarring as it is, when Cameron jumped in like that, I appreciate the fact that he's keeping them honest on, you know, only mm -hmm. asking questions, only giving answers because it, it keeps the breakdown. Anyway, just pointing out, I like that structure. Ask you, it again. I'm sorry, because sorry. I, I don't even know if that's my position. It's, you, it's really you, foreign to me. You, you had argued that, that what God's election actually is, and I think that you're, you are agreeing that, that God is electing the church, which is, which is the bride of Christ. They're in a, now in a relationship with Christ. But that the condition for God to elect them is in response to them having personal faith. Is that not your position? Yes, I would say that's my position. Okay. So if you have personal faith in Jesus Christ, are you already in relationship with Jesus Christ? Yes. So can you explain to me how I am elected to have a relationship with Jesus Christ on the condition of already having a relationship with Jesus Christ? That's where it gets tricky because I'm. You're elected because you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, not elected to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's so, what am I elected to? Justification, glorification. What does Ephesians one say that I that that God has chosen us to do? Uh, be conformed to His image, the image of His Son. And we're chosen in Christ on, on as a uh, as a result of being in Christ. That's why does we're chosen. Does Ephesians one say that we are we are elected under uh, under adoption? Yes. So we we so we are chosen to be in relationship with God in virtue of being in relationship with God. Pause it. Is that right? Oh my gosh, that oh, that's terrible. Yeah. Yeah. I'll let you go first. I don't even know where to start. Um, I almost want to go back and like pause it in increments, but um, several times. Yep. Yeah. Um, let me, yeah. Let, 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 tell you what. Let me ask you a question in the way that he was asking it, Billy. Well, I, I break it apart. What are we elected to? In what sense? Well, because <laughs> uh, sometimes we're elected to service. Sometimes we're elected to be well, it, adopted so as the, sons of notice God. Notice the question begging. Notice the question begging. But Tyler's right. saying. Uh, are we elected to relationship with Christ by virtue of being in a relationship with Christ? So he's a he, he, when I trust in the Lord, God chooses, i.e., chooses to place me in Christ, making me one of the elect. Right to receive just a relationship? No, 
It's what? to receive the promises. It's to receive <laughs> adoption, glorification, justification, all those things, right? Life and and what's, they kept saying, like, personal relationship. Like, you have to have a personal relationship to, to be saved. And that's... Scripture actually doesn't talk about that. When you took a look at Rahab, did Rahab have a personal relationship with the Lord of heaven and earth? Uh, she had a fear of him. That's about she it. feared and trusted him. Right. And guess what? It, when yeah. she feared and trusted him, she was placed in Christ. Mm. But it, the, the end goal is not just relationship with him. Right. The end goal is being in him, receiving all the promises, like mm -hmm. you just said, and living with him, enjoying him forever. Correct. So yeah, that they, relationship comes actually at when you put trust in him. That's the beginning of your relationship, right? Yeah. Because now you've chosen to stop listening to your flesh and listen to the Spirit, listen to Christ, and walk with him. And that's where that relationship comes from: is that you are walking and listening to God, trying to do your best to be faithful to Him and to emulate Him and to imitate Him and to love Him and to love your neighbor as yourself. Another thing that I noticed is. It, it, I, I'm like 99% sure Tyler is full Trinity, right? He, he believes in the Trinity. He, he accepts it, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Right. And yet he, he flattens it out. And he says, what does Ephesians 1 say? Are we elected to adoption? Well, yes, but th then he goes from talking about Jesus to talking to just referring to God as God, singular. Whereas when, when it talks about adoption, we are in Christ and we are adopted by the Father. Mm -hmm. That's where we have to have the distinction in the Trinity with who is doing what, because we are adopted and seen as one of his children because we are in his son. Right. So father, son, we take on that, 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 that baptism where you are put, one thing is put into the other and takes on the qualities of that object, right? That's baptism people. That's why when you're placed in Christ, you are washed and made clean uh, because he is washed and made clean. When you're put into Christ, you're elect because he is the elect. When you're, you're, you're a son because he's the son. You're a, a king and reigning because he's a king and reigning. You know, that's, that's the, he's our priest because he's a high priest. Um, but it says for he chose us in him um, before the creation of the, from the foundation of the world, uh, to be holy and blameless in his sight, in love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ. And I think there's this, again, you'd have to break down, well, what do you mean by adoption? Do you, I mean, I mean, in one sense, we are, um, you know, uh, what's, oh, man, my brain, um, uh, considered adopted, but we're still waiting for our future adoption, which Paul already talked about just a couple chapters later, earlier, right? That we're still waiting for our adoption, <laughs> right? So that's, he, you've chosen to be placed into Christ, right? And you're considered adopted. You're considered a son, but it's not until later when you are glorified at the resurrection where you receive your true adoption. You receive true righteousness. Not just considered righteous and blameless, but you will be righteous and blameless and adopted. Sorry, I'm yeah. preaching again. So the, the conflating of relationship with Jesus and relationship with God is incorrect. You mm -hmm. are in a relationship with Jesus by virtue of the fact that you're trusting him. And then you are adopted by the Father. Mm -hmm. And and, and you, you receive everything that Billy just said. Once you uh, reach, persevere to the end. Right. So, oh, so many. Uh, I cringed a lot during that line of question. No, I'd have to think about that more. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll keep yeah. going. Yeah. Um, does God's election ground our salvation, or does our faith and our inclusion in Christ ground our election? I would say the latter. Okay. Can you tell me what is the... Okay. Did you understand that question? No. Me neither. <laughs> I don't I think John what? did either. <laughs> I, 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 and I guess, I guess the difference would be like um, Calvinism, this system over here, you have to be elect first before you can believe. So that would be the grounding of your salvation. And then God, John more God electing you, right? That's the grounding of your right. salvation. Right, versus Cranman, who's more Arminian provisionist. I don't know exactly where he falls. And he, is, he would say, well, no, it is your faith that grounds you in, in your salvation. So I, like, Tyler, Tyler's right answer was one thing, and John's right answer was the other thing. God's promise grounds me in my, in my salvation, right? And his promise is his that if you... If you yeah. yeah, and his promise is that if you, are, if you have faith in me, right, and you walk in faith to me, then you're going to inherit my promises that I've already promised you, right? So the foundation is his promise. But it rests in my faith in keeping his promise, can keeping his condition of faith. 
it's yeah, it's like it, it's like a relationship where you know <laughs> patron client reciprocity uh, how should we understand romans 9 i guess focusing on election is is answering that question i still wish they like at, at this point i'm like this is an election debate not a not a romans 9 debate mm -hmm. you know the word of God that has not failed in verses one through five of chapter nine. I would say that the they, that represents the promises made to Abraham and his uh, that he would save the world through his seed. So you so you think that the word of God given to Abraham is a self it is a promise of sal uh, of salvation? Yes, yeah, so, I mean there's there's other things uh, tied up into that, but yes, ultimately. So then, so then, it, is is salvation ever corporate or is it always individual? I'd say it's. Is salvation ever corporate or is it always individual? Uh, what? Billy, have you quit beating your wife yet? <laughs> like that, that's what this question feels like. Uh, um, he is the savior of the world. But even just on a, like a question level, like how does how does that flow from questions from Tyler's point about? The promises in one through five. I don't know. I don't know. Just the conversation threw me there. I wasn't sure if you understood it. I didn't. I mean, I mean, isn't I mean, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, right? He's a savior of the world. I mean, that's those are those are you know he's a, he's a savior of individuals, you know, and he places them in Christ, but he's also the savior of the world. Yeah. <sighs> it's it's yeah. primarily corporate and secondarily individual. So you, you would say our justification is primarily corporate? No, that I would say yes. that we are, our justification is individual. It's, pos uh, it's, it's primarily corporate because you don't receive justification until you're placed in Christ, correct? Well, it, it, I would say it's primarily individual. Your justification is your right. own, it, it, but it's, you're a part it's, of a corporate uh, body. It's saying that it's, it's corporate does not take out the the individual application, right? It's me trusting in God and then him placing me in Christ and being justified through Christ, through that corporate headship of Christ. So on the justification topic, it sounds like it's kind of six of one, half a dozen of the other. Because yeah. I, I, I don't think it really matters. Because you're right, it, it is a corporate body that he has defined, but he is individually, Billy, when you repent, putting you in Christ and mm -hmm. justifying you. And right. Yeah. So I through the being part of the corporate body of Christ. Yeah. And then asking, is it primarily one or the other? It leaves up, you know, like well, it's like sixty percent. Yeah, like just like when a lot of gray area. Yeah, it, it. Tyler said, you know, there was a question that I think Cameron butted in and said, "You just probably say both, <laughs> right?" Later on, there's a question. Yeah. 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 It's not an either or. Our it's election. A, yeah corporate if that makes sense uh, i mean I, I, uh, so is our so our justification is incorporate is our sanctification corporate yes and no is or, our I, I would say corporate? i would say i would say uh, i think we are sanctified as a corporate body and also as individuals so if god's promise to abraham was about salvation and salvation then is individual though it has corporate applications um what how how do you move from the fact that that is the word of God that hasn't failed to this passage is not about individual salvation? Real quick, they're still talking about verses one through five, right? Mm, kind of, yeah. The verses one through it's not yeah. as good. The word of God has failed. I I, I don't know. I just I don't know. anyway. Sorry. I just want to make sure I was understanding. What I mean, were. Paul talks about in the verse, you know, one to five about, you know, who, you know, received, who are the, the, oh, let's see, I have it somewhere right here. Oh, I don't have it there. Part one. Oh, there it is. Um, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the temple service, the promises, you know. So, I mean, there's a giant list of things there. Yeah. And, and, and Paul is, into... is talking about big genetic Israel right there, who belong, all that stuff. So those promises are not salvation. Those promises are 
physical promises that they got. Right. And, and the goal was through you, I'm going to bless the world. People are going to look at you. He says, say, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Right. Chapter six is referring back to the promises. Like it is tying in this idea from chapter eight of the salvation and the security that you have. Mm-hmm. And, and, and talking specifically, one through five is talking about physical Israel and what right. they had. Right. So I, I, yeah, I guess I would have called that out. I don't think that they're on topic there. Right. Whatever. Because the word of God was was given uh, corporately. Okay. I'm trying to think how to parse this. This is this is complex. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Um, so you you uh, you and 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 Abisiano, um i hope i'm pronouncing that by the way i i, I respect him as a scholar I, I i don't want to miss i've just never heard it really pronounced um uh make a lot out of the historical context of the the citations um from malachi and others um i i wanted to ask you why you think it is that we have to rigidly keep the original context of the prophet into the new testament citation it's not that it's it needs to be kept rigidly. I just see I, I see no basis to overturn that sort of concept, and I also see the same corporate concept carried over into into uh, the New Testament. We see, uh, for example, in Romans eleven, where Paul describes Israel or des- describes the uh, the elect group as being uh, a branch grafted into uh, an olive tree. So. Our, our election is determined by our, our, our connection with the olive tree. And so, so that, that to me is, is, is a corporate mode of, 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 of thought. And also in Ephesians 1, we're chosen in him. We're chosen uh, because uh, we're in Christ. And, and that to me, so I, I, I see no reason to, uh, I see no reason, at least in the text, that Paul has, has moved on to some other type of election. Are you individually engrafted into the tree through your salvation? Yes. Okay, so um, part your your main argument for for the the choice of Jacob over Esau and and Isaac over Ishmael being corporate just is these Old Testament passages, right? But at the same time, you're now saying that the Old Testament passages aren't actually um, the the evidence um, that that it has to be that it has to be corporate that the corporate comes from elsewhere within the context. So, do you see the circularity of that? No, I don't grant that. I think that um, it's it's both. I think that the election in the Old Testament, to me, seems uh, it seems corporate, and the evidence. And I think there's additional evidence for thinking that Paul has not overturned that by what we see, what we also see in the New Testament. Okay, you see what I'm okay. saying? I don't. I don't. I'm not using the New Testament, or I'm not. I'm not interpreting the Old Testament necessarily with these like Ephesians. But what I'm saying is that it seems to me that if you if you take these Old Testament uh, passages, it, they definitely seem to be referring to corporate election. I see no reason to think Paul has uh, disregarded that or changed it. And on top of that, I see that there's evidence that he hasn't in the New Testament. Well, with, so okay. my, minus. Oh, oh, okay. Uh, that was a lot, and they covered some of the stuff we've already talked about. Mm-hmm. Any any comments on that, right there? I don't know. It's like, what do you? What are they trying to accomplish? <laughs> what's what's the question trying to accomplish? So I, I don't even understand because he they, they go back and forth so much in in trying to I don't know. Like it gets so parsed. As well, this. here's the strategy, right? But Tyler's still trying to prove it's individual, so he asked John, "Hey, John, uh, is sancti- sanctification, is glorification, is justification? Are those things individual or corporate?" And, and he's expecting the answer to be individual. Like, I was justified, I will be sanctified, and then I will be glorified. Mm-hmm. Uh, the problem is, John keeps saying, well, it's kind of both. And it, it kind of is, right? We just talked about that. Six of one, half a dozen of the other. Right. Corporately, yes. Sanctification, I think, is more personal. But justification comes by being in Christ. It is corporate. It is by, through him as the elect, we become elect. And then glorification, yes, individually we are glorified, but is through our relationship with him and the fact that we are part of this kingdom that he's established that we will be glorified at all. So it is corporate as well. And so that kind of, I think 
ruined Tyler's strategy there to move from, well, those things are, are individual, so therefore we should assume that when Paul talks about salvation, he is talking about it only in individual terms. And then you have John hanging, like reiterating the fact that, well, no, it's kind of both. And the Old Testament doesn't, is, is corporate. And Paul is just pulling that forward and using those as examples the way they were used there. Mm-hmm. So it's like Tyler sees it as completely inappropriate. And John, I, we would say rightly, is saying, no, it, it works. You should bring that forward. It, it, it is how Paul is using it. Right. You know, it, it's... <sighs> There's so many things I wanted to say. It's sanctification, to be set apart, right? Right, right. Um, it, it, you have individual and you have corporate, right? When you put faith in the Lord, you are set apart, i.e. sanctified in mm-hmm. the Son. You are set apart in Christ. Now you're part of that corporate body. But you also see that, you know, I have set apart a people, Right corporate people right israel was set apart among the uh, from the other nations right um so you, you see both concepts uh, we try to there's so much like either or and if it's this it can't be this um but the, but the the scripture is is much bigger than that um and the context is much bigger than that as well all right it, we may have to cut off the last few questions here in a minute but uh we'll let it run for just a couple more the the assumption of the of the of the context of the Old Testament passage, what actually else from the passage makes it seem like? Because I mean, your your opening statement was, well, if it sounds like this and it sounds like this and it sounds like this, but we need other reasons not to. If if it sounds like individual salvation, what other part of this of this passage tells you that these people stand for individuals? If it isn't that that assumption about the context. I'm sorry, I had to break in there. Uh, I got a chance to read John's uh, opener before the debate. He he shared it to one of the groups we're in, and um, uh, in a, a private discussion, not mm-hmm. a Facebook group. And it, it was interesting. I, I had that same thought: was if you grant that Romans nine sounds like that, then I, I could see Tyler grabbing a hold of that that yeah. admission and using it on you later. Whereas I, I don't think it necessarily sounds like that. I mean, can can you sit here and you know hold your head right and make it sound individual? Of course, but uh, I you know now that we've gone through Romans, we understand what it's saying. It sounds corporate to me. Like so, I I, I think I would have withheld that kind of right. uh, admission, just because yeah, here he is later on using it against him. But he he makes the point though. Um, I don't know if he's already made it or he made it earlier. Um, that you know, there's many passages that you know in essence, face value, if you just had them out of context, um, you know, it, you know, oh, you have to obey all the law, right? You just take mm-hmm. Paul, is it in Romans, where he says, you know, the doers of the law, you were justified? Yeah. Let's take that one passage out of context, <laughs> right? Oh, he's talking about the Mosaic law, so you, if you do the Mosaic law, you're justified. Yeah, and you're right, and, and he, he describes it as a, or he, he gives a story in his opening. Again, go capturing Christianity, and listen to the full debate. Uh, but a, a verse that is near and dear to our heart is uh, our topic, I should say, is um, in the in the seven woes. I think Paul or Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and says, "You tithe, and you should, but you you neglect the weightier things of the law." And then you have pastors now going, "See, Jesus said you should tithe, right? Therefore, tithing. That's not <laughs> anyway." Right, but it also says it's like mint and cumin. So does that mean that's what I have to give? I mean, that's if we're going like verbatim Spice here. Spice cabinet only. Right. Yeah, no, not, not yeah. money. Spices. Yeah. Yeah. Context from the Old Testament passage. Do you mean that they that they don't stand as individuals? Is that what you meant, Dallas? So so your your position is that they don't stand for individuals, that they represent the corporate body. Is that correct? They they stand as uh they, they stand as individuals, but they're not as they're not elected as individuals qua individuals. They're not it's not merely the election of an individual. So there why, indi- in- so then why does God do. use them as? So then why does God use the individual? If they stand for individuals and God is using them as examples of His, uh, of His sovereign choice, why then can we not understand that to mean that God has electing individuals if they stand as individuals? They don't. They don't only stand as individuals. That's what I'm saying. They they also stand as when God chooses Jacob, He simultaneously chooses Israel. So where in the God, where in the passage says that? It says it in Genesis. Where in the passage of Romans nine says that Paul, that's what Paul is doing? That's where we're talking about context. 
again, not all Israel is Israel. That is proof that he is focusing on corporate bodies, right. but redefining which Israel we're talking about. Right. That Paul is using that 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 well, Paul is the, using the, the individual citation. that Paul is using. So so you're getting it from the citation, but you just said that the yeah. citation isn't where you're actually getting it from. No, I no, I said I'm getting it from the citation. But I'm all, I also find further evidence of this mode of election in the New Testament as well. Okay. But I'm, I'm so, definitely getting it from the citation. So Matthew cites Hosea 11 in saying that out of Egypt I called my son. In that context, it's dealing specifically with Israel being called out in the past. Does that mean that Hosea dealing with the nation of Israel, that Matthew cannot mean Jesus individually because that was the context of the Old Testament citation? No. Ecbatic fulfillment. Mm -hmm. It was a coincidence. It was not telic different situation altogether mm -hmm. i mean that uh, why is this I, I would never i would never say that um old testament passages cannot be reinterpreted or 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 uh cast in a new light or or given a prophetic voice i'm, I'm not saying that what i'm saying is all right okay I'm, that's not, i don't know if that's an answer or it is I, 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 would, I, I would say no I, mean, I, would so say I, no. I understand that you want to say so then my question is exegetically what what is the line of demarcation between those two things between Matthew and here in Romans nine? Why is one? Wh why can you do it with one but not the other? I think um, in this case, I would say um, I would say my main reason for accepting it here is is just reading through Abishano. I'm I'm not an exegete, but I would say he he's built a case by looking into the Old Testament. Okay. And, and that's the reason I, I think the the, uh, the body of evidence is further in support of, of Paul not overturning this mode of election. Okay. I can't say that that's a, I would say just the body of evidence leads me to believe that in this case, rather than in Hosea. Okay. I'm not an exegete, so I, I can't, I don't. It, if these. Context. Why is that not the answer? When you have in, in the end of Galatians 4, <clears throat> Paul calling Israel the child of Hagar. Is that mm -hmm. name? Hagar? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's not true. Right. But he's he's explaining it. And, and so he goes on to explain, why is, is is he saying Israel is the child of a slave? Because they're under the law, and Hagar is compared to the law, and etc. And then all these Gentiles who are grafted in. And, and, and the firstborn. Israel, <laughs> the spiritual Israel, who is now firstborn through Christ. We're children of Sarah, even though some of the... Like, is he using that uh, inappropriately? No, because he's explaining it, right? Right. He's explaining the change. So if he doesn't ever explain the change, then we should assume that he is going to use it in the way that it was meant at the time. Right. And again, it goes back to not all Israel are from Israel, and he makes the point with two examples of Abraham's son and then Isaac's son to get to Israel, just to show that hey, even before this happened, it's not just not. It's not how it works. It's not how it ever ever worked. God can can give a promise with specificity. Right. It doesn't have to be an open-ended thing. Right. And going back to uh, corporate election to begin with, I mean, Paul is obviously talking about a corporate body in Romans 9, but it's not about corporate election in general. It's the same subject that Paul has been on for eight chapters. Now it's kind of narrowing down to this, you know, this supposed failed promise uh, that God made to the ethnic Israel, and he's just explaining that he's narrowing down and, and giving us fulfillment that no you guys got it wrong it's not about you know all of your you know genes and where you came from and who your father was it's about you know the same promise that we gave abraham that you know because he obeyed my voice i.e he walked in faith that's why i'm giving him this that's the same promise is that that's what it's always been that i've already discussed in romans chapter four that the promise to abraham and his descendants is a righteousness that comes by faith the promises come by faith yeah um and the there was two examples are not about salvation they're about providing the example of it's not about genes <laughs> yeah and god's prerogative to choose specifically which lineage yeah who is his kingdom and yeah uh, again romans 9 10 11 is about the redefining of who israel is not physical not lineage not not genes but spiritual different lineage that's his kingdom that he's going to carry forward into the new heavens and new earth and they're going to live with him forever mm-hmm so. Yeah, the kingdom of God isn't based upon race. It's based upon faith uh, and being placed into the king's kingdom, which being placed into Christ and being part of that collective kingdom, that corporate kingdom. Yep. Um, overall, again, I enjoyed the debate. 
uh, I think there was some some confusion in there. Uh, mm-hmm. Some things weren't worded the best. Uh, John, I think, was caught off guard by some of the questions. But but you know, it happens. Uh, Billy and I have never done a public debate before. I imagine I would get tongue tied at some point or another. But uh, what what I wish had happened was either the name I just wish the debate had been called something different. You know, election something to do with election or they had spent more time on Romans and going through it. Uh, that would have been nice. Mm-hmm. I wanna, I, I'd like to see uh, strong ex- exegetical arguments one way or the other. But. Yeah. Yep. Um, are we going to continue this or no? Or are we good? I, well, I know you've got something coming up in a few minutes. And right. And right. I think we've I made mean, our point. Okay. Yeah, All no, right. I, I, th- I think we're good. I, and uh, this is what, what are we sitting at now? Uh, hour 20? Hour and a half, yeah. Hour and a half. So this is our main and our mini. Our, we can put it up early. I don't, whenever you hear this, this is when it went up. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, any questions, comments, thoughts, down at gmail.com. Also, if you're in the Facebook group, feel free to throw it out there. Um, yeah. Uh, also, go check out Cram and uh, join Layton on Soteriology 101 and defend their openings. Uh, mm-hmm. you, you deserve to hear John speak for himself. And then I, I would assume Tyler, oh, I think his, his podcast is called The Freed Thinker. Mm-hmm. Something like that. Yeah, I'm fairly certain that's what it is. It's got like a golden eagle thing on the front. Uh, I, I, Yeah, The Freed Thinker podcast. I would bet money that he's going to have some kind of review there at, at some point in the near future. So check on that. And then lastly, uh, go check out Capturing Christianity and uh, give them a sub because uh, Cameron's got some great videos. Yeah, yep. and and I covet his camera. <laughs> <laughs> it's very sharp. All right, all right. Till next time. God bless. God bless.